on World News Tonight. Diplomatic feud. France and America discuss on middle ground following heated security talks. COVID compassion. USA steps in to help the struggling world with vaccine inequality. Infection repercussions. Germany decides either to get jabbed or go home. Garden garage. Taxis in Thailand are put to rest but with a green cause. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Anuradhi Wickramasinghe. Good evening and thank you for joining with us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage with a diplomatic feud between the US and France. French President Emmanuel Macron said his ambassador will be sent back to the United States next week after President Joe Biden agreed that consulting France before announcing a security pact with Australia could have prevented a diplomatic row. Following last week's sudden and stunning rift over a global arms deal, France and the US are working to restore normal relations. The office of French President Emmanuel Macron said on Wednesday he would send his ambassador back to Washington after a phone call with U.S. President Joe Biden. Hey, well, good morning from Australia. <laughs> the French cried foul last week after news broke that the U.S. and U.K. had secretly negotiated a deal to sell nuclear submarines to Australia. As a result, Australia nixed a $40 billion deal to buy warships from France. In dramatic fashion, Macron recalled his envoys from Washington and Canberra. The episode marked a rare diplomatic rebuke between close military allies. Not all saw the French outcry as proportionate. On Wednesday, UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson told his French counterparts, in French, to quote, get a grip and give me a break. I just think it's, it's, it's time for some of our dearest friends around the world to, you know, prone and grip uh, about all this, uh, and donner moi un break. Uh, because this is uh, fundamentally a, a, a great step forward for global security. Following Wednesday's phone call between Macron and Biden, the French president's office said the leaders agreed to launch in-depth consultations to rebuild trust. The White House on Wednesday said Macron and Biden will meet in Europe at the end of October. We have some good news for you. China has pledged to stop building coal-fired power plants overseas and could cut $50 billion of investment as it slashes future carbon emissions. Analysts said, although Beijing's own domestic coal program is still propping up the fossil fuel. China's President Xi Jinping has declared that his country stopped building new energy projects abroad that use coal, a move that was immediately welcomed by the United States and the head of the United Nations Climate Change Conference. The announcement at the UN General Assembly could affect 44 coal plants earmarked for Chinese state financing, totaling 50 billion US dollars, according to Global Energy Monitor, a US think tank. That has the potential to reduce future carbon dioxide emissions by 200 million tons a year. Environmental groups said it would force big coal financiers like the Bank of China linked with 10 gigawatts of overseas coal power capacity to draw up a timetable to withdraw from the sector. Beijing is the largest source of financing for coal power plants globally, and Xi's announcement will have a far-reaching impact on coal power expansion plans in countries like Bangladesh, Indonesia, Vietnam and South Africa. However, Xi's carefully worded statement revealed few details and left room for existing projects to continue. There are already more than 20 Chinese-financed coal-fired power units under construction in the world, according to data from the Boston University Global Development Policy Center. Another 17 are in planning stage. The new commitment also doesn't address China's plans to expand its own coal-fired power plants. According to a report published by a European think tank, China's domestic program accounts for more than half of all the coal-powered plants under construction through the world. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson pushed the world to grow up and tackle climate change during his annual United Nations address to world leaders. Let's cross over to other there in a world news special correspondent Hasithi Abe Sekara reporting from Plymouth in UK for more. Hasithi? Yes, Anuradhi. Prime Minister Boris Johnson has said in a speech to the United Nations, a climate summit of world leaders in 40 days' time will be the turning point for humanity. 
He warned that global temperature rises were already inevitable, but called on his fellow leaders to commit to major changes to curb further warming. The Prime Minister also said it was time to listen to the warnings of scientists. Look at COVID if you want an example of gloomy scientists being proved right. Setting the tone for November's meeting, he said, countries must make substantial changes by the end of the decade if the world is to stave off further temperature rises. Prime Minister Johnson praised China's President Xi Jinping for his recent pledge to stop building new coal fire energy plants abroad. But he called on the country, which produces 28% of global greenhouse gas emissions, to go further and end its domestic use of coal, saying the UK was proof that it could be done. Back to you, Anuradhi. All right, thank you. That was Other There in the World News special correspondent Hasiti Abe Sekera reporting from Plymouth in the UK. The Taliban's new foreign minister has asked to address world leaders at this week's United Nations General Assembly meeting in New York. The ambassador of Afghan government, ousted by the Taliban last month, has also requested to speak, with the UN yet to decide who will represent the country at the world body. Who will represent Afghanistan at the United Nations? That's the question UN officials are now facing since the Taliban took over the country last month. The international body has confirmed that it has received two letters, one from the currently accredited Afghan ambassador Ghulam Isaac Zai with a list of his delegation, and another from the Taliban's Minister of Foreign Affairs, proposing a new representative and requesting to address world leaders at the 76th General Assembly. The United Nations is a credible institution in the world and it is their duty to recognize our government. We also expect other countries in Europe, in the region, near and far, as well as Islamic countries is to strengthen their diplomatic relations with us and recognize our government. The acceptance of the Taliban's proposed ambassador would be an important step in the hardline Islamist group's bid for international recognition. In cases of disputed seats, the decision lies with the General Assembly's nine-member credentials committee, including the US, China and Russia. Until one is made, delegations whose credentials have been challenged retain all their rights, meaning Afghanistan's current representative remains in the seat for now. It is rare for the committee to accept the credentials of an ousted government, though not unprecedented. When the Taliban last ruled between 1996 and 2001, the committee deferred its decision and the ambassador of the toppled government remained in his seat. The UN says no meeting of the Credentials Committee has been scheduled so far, though a decision is unlikely to happen during the General Assembly's current session. Afghanistan is scheduled to give the last speech on the final day on the 27th of September. Amid deteriorating conditions in migrant camps on both sides of the U.S.-Mexico border, U.S. authorities tried to deal with thousands of mostly Haitian migrants that have gathered, releasing some in South Texas while deporting others on flights. As authorities grapple with deteriorating conditions at a southern U.S. border camp where thousands of migrants have gathered, most of them from Haiti, the White House is pushing back on pressure from all sides. Press Secretary Jen Psaki on Wednesday acknowledged the poor conditions and condemned the U.S. Border Patrol agents' use of reins to intimidate migrants trying to cross the river. We've watched the photos of Haitians gathering under a bridge, many with families, and the horrific video of the CBP officers on, horse, on horses using brutal and inappropriate measures against innocent people. I think it's important to take to address that and separately address what our immigration policies are. The images led Vice President Kamala Harris on Wednesday to raise grave concerns in a call with DHS Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas, her spokesman said. Saki said the agents have been put on administrative leave while the incident is investigated. Meanwhile, the government is continuing to fly hundreds of people back to Haiti while releasing some into the U.S. Saki defended the Biden administration's use of a sweeping Trump-era public health order used to expel migrants known as Title 42. Title 42 is not an immigration policy. It is a, it is a health authority because we're in the middle of a pandemic. U.S. politicians from both parties have criticized Biden's handling of the situation. Republicans have said the Biden administration has encouraged illegal immigration by relaxing some of the hardline policies put in place by Donald Trump.
while Democrats have expressed anger over the treatment of migrants seeking asylum at the border. Representative Maxine Waters held a press conference with members of the Congressional Black Caucus Wednesday demanding action. The expulsion flights to Haiti, where a presidential assassination, rising gang violence and a major earthquake have spread chaos in recent weeks, have also faced international criticism. The head of the UN Refugee Agency has warned that expulsions to such a volatile situation might violate international law. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. Moving on with yet another election update. With Angela Merkel nearing her day to say goodbye, she completes her final obligations as Chancellor. To get more details on this, other there in a world news special correspondent, Inuka Aponso joins us now from Cleve in Germany. Inuka? Yes, Anura, the German Chancellor Angela Merkel honored German soldiers who took part in the military evacuation operation from Kabul last month. During a ceremony at Seed of Military Base west of Hamburg, German Defense Minister and a great crime Karen Bauer promised to continue to do everything we can to get more people out of Afghanistan, particularly those who have assisted the German military during its 20-year presence in the country. She also recalled the 13 brave fallen U.S. comrades who were killed by an Islamic State suicide bomber outside the gates of Kabul airport, complicating efforts to evacuate Afghan civilians. Germany lost 59 soldiers during its two-decade-long mission there, Kram Karamba was said, adding that we remember those who suffered injuries, including those you can't see. She called on European Union allies to show the will, power and also the strength to turn Europe and the European pillar within NATO into an actor which operates at eye level with others. Back to you, Anuradi. All right, thank you. That was other there in a World News Special Correspondent Inuka Ponzo reporting from Cleve in Germany. Pfizer BioNTech jab has now been given the green light from the Food and Drug Administration and will be administered solely for senior citizens and at-risk patients within America. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration authorized a booster shot of the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine on Wednesday for Americans 65 and older and some considered high risk. The third jab is to be given at least six months after completion of the second dose. The FDA authorization would include people most vulnerable to the disease and in high-risk frontline jobs. President Joe Biden announced in August the government's intention to roll out booster shots for people aged 16 and older this week, pending approval by the FDA and CDC. A U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention advisory panel could vote on Thursday on the use of a third shot of the vaccine, according to an agency official earlier in the week. The FDA overwhelmingly rejected a call for broader approval, with top members split on the need for boosters for the general population. Some of the agency's senior scientists argued that current evidence does not support boosters for all those aged 16 and above. Some countries, including Israel and Britain, have started rolling out booster campaigns. The United States promised to buy 500 million more COVID-19 vaccine doses to donate to other countries as it comes under increasing pressure to share its supply with the rest of the world. It's been billed as a historic commitment by Joe Biden. At a virtual summit with global leaders, Biden said the COVID-19 pandemic was an all-hands-on-deck crisis morning, as he pledged more doses for the UN's vaccine distribution system, COVAX. The United States is buying another half billion doses of Pfizer to donate to low- and middle-income countries around the world. This is another half billion doses that will all be shipped by this time next year. And it brings our total commitment to of, donation, of donated vaccines to over 1.1 billion vaccines to be donated. That equates to more doses donated than the rest of the world combined. Following the U.S.'s lead, Spain, Italy and Japan announced plans to up their shipments of jabs too. But the sad reality is that those pledges don't go nearly far enough to close the vaccine inequality gap around the world. Across Africa, for example, just 3.6% of the eligible population has been inoculated, compared to more than 60% in Western Europe. This is a moral indictment of the state of our world. It is an obscenity. We pass the science test, but we are getting an F 
in ethics. The World Health Organization says only 15% of vaccines pledged to the COVAX scheme have been delivered, and it has urged vaccine producers to prioritize the program. Worldwide, almost 6 billion COVID-19 doses have been administered over the past year, representing about 43% of the global population. Germany has introduced a new policy to combat COVID. Germans who have not been vaccinated against COVID-19 will no longer receive compensation for lost pay if they have to quarantine. Germany will stop paying compensation to unvaccinated workers who are forced into quarantine. That's according to Health Minister Jens Spahn Wednesday. He said it was unfair to ask taxpayers to pay for people who refuse to get inoculated. The rules will take effect by October 11th at the latest. It will affect people who test positive for the virus and those returning from trips to high-risk countries, which currently includes Britain, Turkey and parts of France. Critics have said such rules are basically a mandate for COVID vaccinations, as many workers cannot afford to stay at home without pay. There are also privacy concerns. Germany has strict laws on data privacy and employers usually have no right to ask staff for information on health issues. Vaccinations are not compulsory in Germany, but new measures have made it more inconvenient to be unvaccinated. Some German states have allowed businesses like restaurants to choose whether to admit people who test negative or only those who have been vaccinated or recently recovered. Germany has fully inoculated 74% of adults, slightly ahead of the EU average. Welcome back. And now for more world news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Tango and soccer fans got together to pay tribute to Argentine soccer player Diego Maradona at the Tango World Cup in Buenos Aires. The ensemble, made up of 20 artists, included renowned singer Kakuza Castiello. Jewish worshippers wearing face masks prayed at the Western Wall on Sunday at a special priestly blessing during the holiday of Passover, an event usually attended by thousands. The U.S. House Armed Services Committee says North Korea is continuing to publicly announce plans to develop weapons that threaten the U.S. and its allies. According to U.S. National Defense Authority, Authorization Act, the regime possesses a relatively modest nuclear arsenal compared to Russia and China. A series of attacks against the Taliban have taken place in Afghanistan, resulting in the deaths of Taliban members as well as civilians. Meanwhile, Afghans continue to seek asylum outside the country. Taiwan has submitted an application to join the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, a free trade deal designed to liberalize trade and investment among Pacific Rim economies. Major automakers are hedging their bets, calculating that a change in political winds could shift the balance towards hydrogen in an industry shaped by early mover Tesla's decision to take the battery-powered road to clean cars. Battery power is ahead in the race to become the car technology of the future, thanks to the likes of Elon Musk's Tesla. But don't rule out the underdog, hydrogen. That's according to major automakers like BMW and Audi. They are just two of the firms developing hydrogen fuel cell passenger vehicles as the industry moves away from fossil fuels to meet climate targets. Germany itself has bet billions on hydrogen fuel in sectors like steel and chemical. BMW is hydrogen's biggest supporter among German car makers and aims for a mass market model to be ready in around 2030. Its rivals are also investing. Volkswagen's Audi brand said it had put together a team of more than 100 mechanics and engineers who were researching hydrogen fuel cells for the whole VW group. Hydrogen is also seen as a sure bet by top truck makers like Daimler and Volvo who see batteries as too heavy for long distance commercial vehicles. For now though, fuel cell technology is expensive, making the production of mass market cars a challenge. The cells, where hydrogen passes through a catalyst to produce electricity, are complex and contain expensive materials. VW Group CEO Herbert Diess has tweeted that it isn't the solution to climate change. But Toyota takes a different view. It already has a fuel cell car on sale, though it remains a niche market. European General Manager Stephen Herbst says both battery electric cars and hydrogen could progress side by side. Herbst is part of the Hydrogen Council business group, 
which forecasts that hydrogen will power more than 400 million cars by 2050. And finally tonight, with the demand for taxis drying up in Thailand and thousands of drivers leaving town, one Bangkok cab company has turned its vehicles into mini vegetable gardens, hoping to take the edge of the coronavirus crunch. The taxi cooperative has taken hundreds of cars off the road in the past year amid a slowing economy caused by months of lockdown to prevent the spread of COVID-19, which has left many drivers with insufficient income to pay lease on their vehicles. The cooperative grows vegetables on the roofs and bonnets of 300 of the disused cabs, providing its drivers and members with food to share while sending a message to the government to do more help with the hardship. An administrator within the company said, though the gardens keep people occupied, they are only temporary fix and to a certain extent it has helped with lessening stress and also suggested that the government should step in to help them. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Suzanne Shanali will join you again tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Anradi Vikramasinghe. Until then, stay safe and have a great night.